Well, welcome back, everyone. Uh, today, I'd like to start a series of lectures talking about the fourth of the major study design options that we epidemiologists consider when we're trying to address the relationship between a risk factor and an outcome. Remember, we talked about cross-sectional studies. We talked about experimental studies. And, and then we talked about cohort studies. And now I'd like to talk about a, a fourth option, case control studies. And, but first, I want to uh, review the basic reasons, in some sense, why we have case control studies. But first, before we talk about case control studies, I'd like to review a few results, a few conclusions we made about the strengths and limitations of cohort studies that, that justify considering the use of case control studies as an alternative study design. The main limitation of a cohort study is that if we're measuring an outcome that's relatively rare, an outcome that takes a long time for people to develop, then we're going to have to have sufficient numbers of people in our cohort study and follow them for relatively long periods of time to be able to record enough outcomes in, say, the exposed group and enough outcomes in the non-exposed group to see if the outcome group has a higher incidence of developing that particular outcome. So our cohort studies might require large numbers of subjects who are being followed for long periods of time, and that might be very prohibitive in terms of time and in terms of resources, namely money. In that case, the prospective cohort study becomes a very inefficient study design to consider. And that justifies using considering alternatives. Well, so far we've considered one alternative, the retrospective cohort study, building, using previously collected data to build historical cohorts that existed in the past, follow them in the past to see who developed outcomes and who didn't develop outcomes. But what if you don't have that historical data, the ability to, to create a historical cohort, a retrospective cohort study. What alternatives do you have? And that's where the case control study comes into play. This is a phrase, a word, that people have used uh, to describe the type of study I want to talk about. Case control studies have been at least described by one individual, Alvin Feinstein an epidemiologist from Yale, who called them trohawk studies. Now, trohawk is not a commonly used word, at least in the English language. I suspect many of you, if not all of you, will say that this is the first time they've been exposed to that word trohawk. But if you go on the web and Google the word trohawk, you will find references to epidemiologic studies. Well, what exactly does trohawk mean? Why am I representing it in this term? Well, I'm a little bit dyslexic. And the whole purpose of, of, of using the word trohawk, T-R-O-H-L-C, is if you spell it in the opposite direction, it spells the word cohort. And I think that's a good point to keep in mind because it, it links, it does two main purposes. It links the idea of a case control study with a cohort study. And it links the idea that case control studies in some sense are working in an opposite direction than cohort studies. And those are the two points I'd like you to keep in mind as we go through the series of lectures on case control studies. First, let me describe how I learned about case control studies when I was a student at the school, you know, some 30 some odd years ago. The way case control studies were, were taught to me in this, let's call it the old description, is that in some sense they are backwards in their relationships to cohort studies. They have a backwards study direction to them. Remember, cohort studies started out with people who were exposed, smokers, non-smokers. Follow them forwards in time to see who got disease and didn't get disease. You went from studying the effect, excuse me, from studying the cause, smoking, to studying the effect, say coronary heart disease. You'll see in case control studies, it's almost the opposite. We're going to start out with people who already have heart disease. The the effect, and we're going to go back and figure out what the cause was. In the past, were they smokers or were they not smokers? So it has an opposite direction than the cohort studies had, and we'll, we'll, we'll stress that as we go through these series of lectures. We start out with people who already have the disease. That's opposite of what we did in cohort studies. Cohort studies, we started out with people who were at risk for developing disease, and the Framingham Heart Study eliminated up front when it was first created, anybody who already had cardiovascular disease. Because if you already had cardiovascular disease in 1950, when the study was being developed, 
you are no longer at risk for developing a first case of cardiovascular disease in the future. Case control studies are the opposite. We're starting out with people who already have disease. In the old description, they'd say we'd start out with people who don't have disease, people who don't have, say, cardiovascular disease. And what we do is we'd ask both groups about their past. 20 years ago, did you smoke or did you not smoke? So what we're doing is comparing previous exposure histories among the people with the disease and among the people without the disease. That's the backwards direction of this case control study. To try to show that in a figure, here's the, the, the direction we talked about in cohort studies. We started out with people who were at risk of developing disease at baseline. Think of the Framingham Heart Study. We started out with smokers. We started out with non-smokers. We followed people forwards in time. Initially, they were following people for 20 years. And we see which people developed disease in each of those groups. Which people, say, developed coronary heart disease among the smokers and the non-smokers. That's what we were talking about last time, cohort studies. Now, in case control studies, we're going to go the opposite direction. We're going to start out with people who already have coronary heart disease. Those are going to be what we call our cases in our case control study. We're going to compare them to another group of people. And in the old description, those are people who did not have disease. Those are what we call the controls. So today, we enroll a bunch of people with heart disease, a bunch of people without heart disease. And what we do is we ask them about their past. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Did you smoke or not? Were you an exposed person or were you a non-exposed person? Were you a smoker or were you a non-smoker? Is what we would ask these people. So in this old description, the direction was in the opposite way. Cohort study starting with people who don't have disease, exposed, non-exposed, seeing in the future who developed the disease. Case control studies in this old description starting out with people with disease and without disease and asking them about characteristics that happened in the past. And that's why they were in some sense opposite in direction from, from cohort studies. Well, there are a couple of problems with this old description in trying to do case control studies. First of all, and the biggest problem that I'm going to stress over and over again in these series of lectures, the biggest problem in case control studies is who do you select as your controls? For example, Let's suppose you want to know whether oral contraceptive use increases a woman's risk of developing breast cancer. In a case control study, your cases will be women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer. You're going to ask them in the past whether they use oral contraceptive use or not. But now you need to have a comparison group, a control group, people in this old description who don't have uh, uh, breast cancer. Well, let's suppose you do the following. Let's suppose your cases of breast cancer came from a nearby hospital, and you, you went to that hospital and monitored in the, all the admissions and the discharges over, say, a six-month period, and you identified a series of women who had breast cancer diagnosed at that hospital during that period of time. Those are your cases. You're going to ask them about how often they used oral contraceptive use in the past. The problem is you have to now have a comparison group, a group of people who don't have breast cancer. Maybe you want to take them from the same hospital. Who do you select? You want to select a group that doesn't have breast cancer. Under this old definition, the controls were people without the disease. Well, let me ask you, would you feel comfortable if the investigator went to that hospital, wanted to enroll women without breast cancer, and the way that person, the investigator, did it is the investigator went to the nursery and looked at all the newborn baby girls, okay, baby women, and asked those newborn baby women, did you use oral contraceptive use in the past? Well, they're only a few, year, few days old, but you could ask, since you've been alive, have you ever used oral contraceptive use, oral contraceptives? Well, you'd have problems. First of all, these baby women can't answer your question. You'd have to interview their mothers. Their mothers would look at you strangely. And would anyone question whether that would be an appropriate control group? Well, they do not have disease. They do not have breast cancer. Is that enough? to make an individual a valid person to be in this control group? Is, it, is not having disease sufficient? And the answer in your mind is probably no. You have to have some other characteristics to define who's going to be in your control group. Not having disease is not sufficient to be in this old description that we're using about case control studies. There has to be something about these control groups. 
And that's what we're going to be talking about under this new description of case control studies in a moment. But there's another problem in case control studies under this idea that I could enroll women with disease, women without disease, ask about previous use of oral contraceptives, and somehow from that data conclude that oral contraceptive use might increase a woman's risk of developing breast cancer. The question I'm asking is by asking about previous histories among cases and controls and somehow building an association based on the comparison of those previous histories, can we come up with a number that can be interpreted as measuring the effect of oral contraceptive use on the development of breast cancer? When we first started talking about measures of association, we talked about things like risk ratios, rate ratios, odds ratios as measures of association, but also argued that they hopefully could also measure the causal effect of the exposure on the outcome. Now the question is, is what we measure from a case control study any way reflecting the true effect of a risk factor on outcome? So we have to do some sort of a justification to argue that case control studies can also provide numbers, measures of association that have useful interpretations as measuring the effect of a risk factor on the development of disease. Well, both of these problems in this old description, I think, are now resolved by the more modern way we epidemiologists look at case control study designs. It's still going to be a study where you enroll people with disease cases. It's still going to be a study where you enroll another group controls. It's still going to be a study where you ask about previous histories. But now we're going to define the case control study in the following way. We're going to enroll subjects who have developed the disease. Those are the cases. We're going to go to our hospital and identify people, women, who have been diagnosed with breast cancer. Those are our cases. Now, for our controls, we want women who satisfy a certain criterion. It's a difficult criterion to satisfy, but this is the goal of the controls. What we want the controls to do is to reflect the source population that gave rise to those cases. What we're going to be doing is think of the cases in our case control studies as the outcomes of a cohort study that existed in the past. There were people in the past in this cohort study that if they were followed over time, and if breast cancer was measured on them, that the cases of breast cancer that developed in that cohort study would be the same women, the same people, who today you are enrolling in your case control study. So what we're trying to imagine is the cohort experience that gave rise to the cases we're now in our case control study. And we want our controls to reflect that source population. We want our controls to answer exactly how much oral contraceptive use was being used by women in this large cohort that existed in the past that if it was followed over time gave rise to the cases that we have in our case control study. So the role of the controls in, in a case control study is to reflect how much exposure, how much oral contraceptive use existed in the past in the cohort experience, in the cohort study, that if it had been created would have given the, us outcomes who are the cases, the women with breast cancer in our case control study. That's the challenge of selecting the controls. That's the purpose of the control group. Now, the big picture message I want to tell you right now is if you could do that, if you could somehow create that cohort study in the past and somehow measure associations like risk ratios or rate ratios, we can estimate those risk ratios and rate ratios from our case control study if our controls are appropriate. We can estimate things like risk ratios and rate ratios, things we've been talking about for cohort studies, by just asking how common is the exposure among the people who became the outcome cases in that cohort study, and how common is the exposure in the source population, that cohort study itself. And remember, the controls are trying to estimate that bottom uh, figure. They're trying to tell us how common exposure was in this cohort study that gave rise to these cases. So for example, here's a two by two table. You've seen it a lot so far. Let's suppose you had done a cohort study. Forget about case control studies for a minute. Think about cohort studies, what we talked about last time. Say you had a study. You wanted to know whether smoking causes heart disease. You had the Framingham data set. And to make it simple, let's talk about a closed cohort. Let's talk about overall mortality with the Framingham data set. No losses to follow-up. Complete follow-up for overall mortality as an outcome. You have a series of, say, smokers, N1 smokers in your cohort study. You follow them forwards in time, and A of them develop the outcome of death from any cause. 
you have a series of non-smokers, N0. You follow them forwards in time and see them develop the disease. If I asked you to calculate the formula or write down the formula for the risk ratio, you take the estimated risk among the exposed, A divided by N1, and divide that by the estimated risk among the non-exposed, C divided by N0. That's the formula you've been using in homework assignments that we've been talking about up to now for cohort studies, and it's the correct formula. There's nothing wrong with that formula. But mathematically, it can be re-expressed in another way. The risk ratio is mathematically this, also the same as, first just look at, say, the people who developed the disease in your cohort study, all the cases of, of death that happened in your closed cohort study using the Framingham data set. What's the odds of being a smoker among those cases? Remember, A of them were exposed, smoking, and C of them were non-exposed, non-smokers. A over C is nothing more than the odds of exposure, the odds of smoking, in that example I've been talking about, among the people who got the disease. And mathematically, the risk ratio is equal to that odds of exposure among the smokers divided by how common exposure was to begin with in the cohort study. The cohort study has N1 smokers, N0 non-smokers. N1 divided by N0 is the odds of exposure in the entire cohort that you started with. So mathematically speaking, the risk ratio is also equal to the comparison of two exposure odds. The odds of exposure among the people who got the disease, death in that case, divided by the odds of exposure in the original cohort, the source population that gave you all those cases. Remember, in your case control studies, you want your controls to reflect that source population. You want them to tell you how common the exposure was in this cohort study that gave you rise to these cases. Well, that's for a closed cohort. What if you had an open cohort? Again, go back to what we talked about in the cohort studies and what we've been doing for homework exercises. Say you had, you're measuring the incidence rates of developing coronary heart disease. Say your outcome was coronary heart disease in the Framingham data set. And you have smokers and you have non-smokers that you're following over time. Because of losses to follow-up, what were we measuring? We we're measuring incidence rates. We we're looking at how much person time we observed among all the smokers in our study and how many cases of coronary heart disease happened among those among those person time of the smokers. We measured an incidence rate, A divided by K1. That's the incidence rate of developing coronary heart disease among the smokers. We did the same thing for the non-smokers. We looked at how much person time they contributed, K sub zero, how many cases happened out of that person time, C. C over K sub zero is the, is the incidence rate among the non-smokers. We could compare those two incidence rates to calculate a rate ratio, RR. But mathematically, that value for the rate ratio can also be considered, expressed, as first looking just among the people who developed the disease. All your cases of coronary heart disease and asking what's the odds of exposure among the people who developed the disease. And you could divide that by looking at how much person time you had in total and looking at the ratio of how much person time came from the smokers versus how much person time came from the non-smokers. So the rate ratio can also be expressed as the ratio of two expressions that have to do with how much exposure exists among the cases who developed the disease, A divided by C, and the relative amount of person time that was contributed by the smokers versus the non-smokers. So everything we talked about before for cohort studies can be re-expressed as measures of association by comparing how much exposure exists among the people who became your outcomes in the case control study versus how much exposure there was in the source population, the numbers of people in your closed cohort, the amount of person time in your open cohort. What your case control study is going to try to do is estimate that. You're going to have your cases of disease. You can measure how common the exposure was in that. You can measure their odds of exposure among your cases. And if your controls reflect the source population, the odds of exposure among the controls is going to reflect how much exposure existed in the cohort study. So when we measure something called an odds ratio, in ex what we measure was called an exposure odds ratio, in a case control study, we're able to estimate what would happen in the underlying cohort studies if we had the experience, the full experience of that cohort study. So in the next time we get together, I'm going to try to build on this idea that the controls are reflecting the source population. 
from which your cases came from. They're reflecting the underlying cohort study that gave rise to these cases. And I'm going to build on the idea that we can therefore measure from case control studies estimates of what the risk ratios or rate ratios would have been in those underlying cohort studies. Let's start first by talking more about the controls and how we might select them. And that's what we'll do next time. See you then.